We were recently blessed with some new insights into the development of KSP2 by Chris Adderley, senior mechanical concept designer and formerly better known by his KSP4 forum username Natea, creator of many beloved mods for KSP1. The AMA went live in mid-August, but last week he wrote a text post on the forums answering a couple of additional questions, so I thought I'd give you guys a summary. Now, I don't know what's going to be on screen, by the way, just some random gameplay, but I'm not going to be addressing it. It's just there to keep your eyes entertained. Anyway, the Q&A session started with a question about Chris's personal contribution to KSP2's development. He explained that while he doesn't handle asset work directly, he plays a crucial role in inception and concepting. His involvement in the early access release focused on about 10% of the game's inception, which demonstrates the collaborative nature of game development. <laughs> the questions then shifted to part sizes. In KSP2, Chris mentioned that some of the largest parts in the game are in the 80 meter plus size category. However, he highlighted the complexity of measuring colony parts versus vehicle parts due to their distinct characteristics. He also discussed his involvement in the concepting and design phase of colony parts, underlining the importance of refining designs based on player feedback. One question revolved around the difficulty of adding new parts to KSP2. Chris explained that most aspects in KSP2 development are more complex than in KSP1. For instance, the physically based rendering shading model used in KSP2 requires more texture maps than KSP1. A key aspect of KSP2's roadmap is its eventual expansion into interstellar travel. Chris addressed questions about new engine types and the challenges associated with them. He mentioned team interest in larger air-breathing engines and the need to consider supporting parts like intakes and cockpits for a cohesive player experience. Additionally, the concept of gear angled from the fuselage rather than just landing gear that goes straight down and the inclusion of more tires and wheels was something that many members of the dev team want and he added a winky face emoji there, so I guess that means maybe. I'd certainly like to see angled landing gear at some point. Now, when it comes to stars and interstellar travel, questions arose about the scaling of stars relative to Kerbal and the implementation of proper motion in other star systems. Chris mentioned that specific scaling of star meshes is less critical than defining their insulation numbers. Proper motion, however, is a challenge that needs careful balancing in interstellar travel gameplay. The topic of life support systems for colonies in KSB2 was brought up. Chris expressed his reservations about basic life support mechanics, citing that they often need carefully crafted player stories and scalable solutions. He emphasised the importance of supporting various players and play styles and creating gameplay that is engaging without being overly punitive. He was asked what new parts to expect in the next few updates for KSP2, to which he replied, science parts and grid fins. He suggested that the game would continue to introduce new concepts and features that differentiate it from its predecessor, further expanding the KSP2 experience. Regarding legacy parts from KSP1 and the potential for them to be ported to KSP2, Chris explained that the introduction of any part from KSP1 is already a revamp in its own right. He highlighted that KSP2 aims to reimagine and improve upon concepts from the previous game, offering a fresh experience to players while honouring its legacy. Radiation and life support are topics that the team is actively considering. The approach to these features is a bit complex. Ambient radiation, which relates to the time a spacecraft can spend in a radioactive environment, is being discussed. The challenge here is to provide players with tools to gauge radiation levels and to determine mission duration. Point radiation, which involves nuclear engines and reactors, is also a point of interest, but it needs to strike a balance so that players are not compelled to build ships in a specific way. The ideal solution for these features is not set in stone, and player feedback during early access will likely play a significant role in shaping them. The progression for bases and stations will follow real-world concepts, with outposts at the beginning, which have limited utility like fuel depots, and as players progress through the tech tree, they begin to gain access to more advanced functions like shipyards, fuel factories and launch pads. Ultimately, they can create colonies that mimic the full capabilities of the Kerbal Space Center. Crew rotations and resupply are not enforced mechanics currently, but Chris hopes that modders will explore these options when resources and delivery routes become fully operational in the game. The supply route system is still in development and details will be shared later on. He mentioned that the system needs to consider multi-stage deliveries, which might not be as resource efficient as single-stage ones, but should be possible. 
The availability of resources will drive players' choices regarding fuel types. Different planetary environments will encourage the use of specific engines and fuels. The teams seem open to players pursuing different approaches, even if it involves shipping resources from Kerbin to build interstellar empires. Anyway, those were all the most interesting questions and answers that I got out of the Q&A text post last week. If you want to read it in full, then I'll put a link in the video description. But I figured that a lot of folks may have missed Chris's first AMA and might want me to give them the quick TLDR summary. So here's everything that was covered. It began with a bit of a background. Chris started his modding journey long before KSP. Back in high school, he tinkered with games like Star Trek, Armada, and Battle for Middle Earth, but his modding career truly took off when he discovered Kerbal Space Program. Fascinated by KSP's potential, he embarked on a mission to make the game even better by creating mods. This journey of experimentation and creativity eventually led him to the attention of the growing KSP2 development team. Transitioning from modder to developer was not without its challenges. As a modder, Chris had the freedom to create content within the framework provided by KSP1. However, becoming part of the development team provided a different perspective. He gained a deeper understanding of the design decisions and constraints that developers face when creating a game. While he missed the creative freedom of modding, he appreciated the insights gained from the development process. Chris's journey from modding KSP1 to working on KSP2 provided invaluable lessons. He emphasized that his modding experience helped him to understand what works and what doesn't in game design. His ability to experiment and gather player feedback as a modder enabled him to contribute valuable insights to the development team, shaping the game's direction. Finally, Chris acknowledged that game development, like any job, comes with its ups and downs. While some days can be frustrating, other days are filled with the satisfaction of witnessing the progress made by the team, whether through stunning art or the introduction of new gameplay systems. When asked about his favourite milestone in KSP2, Chris expressed unreserved enthusiasm for colonies. He believed that this feature will transform how players experience KSP2 and is a pivotal aspect of the game's future. So clearly he hasn't changed his stance on this when I asked him what his favourite future edition of KSP2 will be back at the Easter event in February. A question regarding the team's awareness of developments in the aerospace industry came up. Chris answered that the KSP2 team has a strong interest in space and is well informed about industry advancements. They maintain an internal channel where they discuss space news and stay updated on new developments. It's testament to their commitment to creating an authentic space exploration experience in Kerbal Space Program 2. Looking ahead, Chris shared two primary goals for KSP2. Firstly, he aspires to convert all KSP1 players, including modders, into KSP2 enthusiasts. Secondly, he aims to make the game more approachable, even for his own mother, by ensuring that she can successfully achieve orbit in KSP2. The introduction of a complex heat system in KSP2 presents a unique set of challenges. Chris identified two major hurdles, scalability and approachability. Ensuring the heat system works seamlessly across various scales, from small to large spacecraft and timescales, is a daunting task. Additionally, making the system approachable for players so that they can understand the mechanics is equally challenging. Striking the right balance between realism and player friendliness is crucial. When asked about his favourite aspects of the new heat system, Chris expressed enthusiasm for how it aligns with player stories and scales well. He highlighted the system's balance between scalability and approachability, considering it a success based on these criteria. It's worth noting that this question did also include the ask that if Chris is being asked to spin questions and make answers as positive as possible, then he needs to blink three times. And uh, well, during his answer, he rapidly blinked a lot more than three times. <laughs> Chris shed light on the intriguing process of determining re-entry colors for celestial bodies in KSP2, explaining that re-entry colors result from multiple processes such as plasma emission, long wave thermal emission, and air compression, he emphasized that each process yields a different color spectrum. The color of re-entry is influenced by atmospheric composition, leading to unique colors for different planets. Addressing the challenge of space planes surviving re-entry in KSP2, Chris assured that the reduction in heat tolerance numbers is
is accompanied by adjustments to the magnitude of heat fluxes. The goal is to maintain a similar re-entry experience to KSP-1, allowing players to land space planes with familiar strategies. While conformal heat shields are not initially planned, parts with heat tiles on the bottom will be introduced to enhance heat management. Chris highlighted the emphasis on approachability in the upcoming science system of KSP-2. In KSP-1, the science system featured what he believed to be obscure behaviours that could be challenging for new players to grasp. The goal in KSP-2 is to provide a more accessible and comprehensible science system. Players should have a similar path of learning and growth, reducing the disparity between novice and experienced players in terms of science collection. Balancing feature development with bug fixes poses a significant challenge in the science update for KSP2. While the team aims to introduce new science features, they must also allocate time to address core bugs. Achieving the right balance between progressing in science development and meeting community expectations for bug fixes is a current priority. Addressing the challenges in designing and implementing science instruments in KSP2, Chris pointed out the difficulty lies more in the tuning of these instruments, determining what each experiment provides in terms of science, its specific requirements, such as the need for a specific case, resources, or time, poses a complex challenge. Tuning these parameters correctly is essential to ensure a balanced and engaging science system. Regarding modding support updates, Chris indicated that modding support will likely come in small waves rather than being in one big update. Early access will be used to gather community feedback on features, including modding support. The intention is to release iterations and adjust based on community input. Chris mentioned the team's desire to provide resources and guides to help modders align their creations with planned game dynamics. Initially, this may involve style guides and information for modders working on parts and user interfaces. The goal is to foster a collaborative environment between modders and the dev team. When asked about visual updates for Kerbin's biomes to make the planet feel more alive, Chris expressed enthusiasm for the idea. The visual effects and sound effects team has concepts to enhance the visual and auditory aspects of biomes, potentially breathing new life into the planet. Chris clarified that they don't intend to directly port specific features that he modded for KSP-1 into KSP-2. Working with the core design team allows him to collaborate on new systems and avoid potential pitfalls from previous modding experiences. While KSP-2's heat system may share some elements with their KSP-1 mods, there won't be any direct ports. Balancing the need for a physics-intensive, performant game with an enjoyable player experience is a complex task. Chris explained that scalability plays a pivotal role in determining performance. Every system in the game must scale with various factors, including vessel size, save size, and time warp. Decisions about performance are made in collaboration with the engineering team, evaluating whether new features can be implemented in a performant manner. Drawing the exact line between performance and gameplay is described as more of an art than a science, considering the diverse player capabilities and progression in the game. Regarding the level of detail and fidelity in designing rocket engines and other parts, Chris explained that the process starts with defining the silhouette of a part, ensuring that it stands out among others. When designing rocket engines, the team conducts research on engine cycles and approximates the plumbing of the engine. The goal is to provide some educational value to players interested in engines. The level of detail is balanced to avoid extremely tiny pipes that alias at long ranges while making engines more detailed than other parts you know, due to their significance. Chris mentioned that the team considered many engine design concepts, including faster than light travel, before rejecting them. He also discussed a whimsical concept called the Fizzer nuclear rocket, which involves a rocket that consumes itself with a constantly detonating nuclear explosion. While it might look visually stunning, its utility in the game is limited, so it's unlikely to be included. Designing parts for theoretical technologies without real-world analogues involves extensive research. Chris delves into white papers, reads diagrams, and explores concept work. The team takes inspiration from tech concepts and engineering principles. For example, if a magnetic nozzle is needed, they draw from various research papers and develop a design style for parts using magnetic nozzles. The approach integrates technical knowledge and engineering realities into the game's design. Chris also talked about the VAB size and that it's not intentionally constrained to make orbital construction more important. Instead, the size of interstellar ships necessitates a larger construction space than the VAB can provide. Orbital construction will enable players to work on the massive scales required for interstellar ships.
When it comes to designing parts, the team at KSP2 takes historical context into consideration. For instance, with the Mammoth 2 engine, they looked at the history of the part, which was inspired by the space launch system in KSP1, featuring the four RS-25 engines. In KSP2, the flexibility of attaching engines in various ways allows players to create SLS-type rocket assemblies without needing a custom part. This way, they could appreciate the Mammoth being turned into just a single massive rocket engine. The plumbing of the Mammoth 2 engine is derived from real-world engines like the F1 and F1B. The design process involves establishing specific guidelines for each type of part, such as fuel tanks. These guidelines help maintain consistency and correspondence between parts and their real-world counterparts. For instance, using gold multi-layer insulation on hydrogen tanks helps players identify the type of fuel. Style elements, like highlighting engines using hydrogen, further contribute to the visual language of the game. Chris confirmed that the rotational artificial gravity ring that we've seen in the teasers and trailers won't simulate different gravity levels in the game. However, KSP2 plans to offer various sizes and roles for gravity rings, especially for colonies. These rings will serve different functions, creating diverse gameplay opportunities. A question was asked about the possibility of having KSP1 style wing pieces added to KSP2, to which Chris responded that the team believes that the current procedural ring system in KSP2 serves all the use cases that were previously handled by the non-dynamic wings in KSP1. However, they are open to feedback and he encouraged players to share any additional use cases that may not be addressed. Interstellar ships are described as big. They expand significantly beyond the typical size categories seen in the game, with parts that could be up to 20 meters wide. Length also becomes a critical factor when working with these parts, offering new ways to assemble large and impressive spacecraft. The team is designing the progression system to ensure that launching rockets won't pose a significant issue in terms of science progression. While the science milestone in KSP2 will be similar to the science mode in KSP1, which didn't have a cash system, resources will become a factor in the future. The goal is to make players feel they have the resources needed to perform various activities from the Kerbal Space Center and colonies. While launching rockets will always have associated costs, the availability of resources at different locations will determine what can be launched and when. Right now, the team at Intercept Games is currently working on the science milestone and addressing bugs. They are in the process of developing new patches to the game to address these issues, with a particular focus on the upcoming science update. But yeah, that's kind of like the TLDR of the uh, hour or so long AMA that Natea did, in addition to that extra little bonus text-based AMA. I hope this was a good comprehensive overview of it. Do you want to see these kinds of videos when they do these big, long, you know, hour-long Q&A sessions that you might not have the time to listen to in full? Let me know in the comment section down below. But I hope this was informative, and if it wasn't, uh, hopefully whatever was on screen was entertaining enough. But that's essentially it. What are my thoughts on the AMA? Well, I guess that while it's certainly interesting to get developer insights into the making of Kerbal Space Program 2, it said a lot without saying a lot. Lots of it's being worked on, we're hoping to do this, we're planning to do that, and I get it, it's not really in Chris's power to disclose stuff he's not really allowed to disclose, but it would be really great if Intercept could at least remove some of the curtain of secrecy and show us a little bit more of what's being worked on and some more hard information about the state of things, especially since we're six months post-release and it's mostly just been bug fixes since then. But yeah, that's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, there should be some end cards there. You can click on, go and click on those. Oh, like the video. I didn't, I didn't ask people to like the video. Whoops.